Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Is this loud enough? Got me? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Windsor Historical Society. Um, this evening, we have a special guest lecture by Beth Caruso. Um, Beth M. Caruso is an award-winning author, and she's been involved in efforts to educate the public about the Connecticut witch trials through her written work and exoneration efforts. Beth's first historical novel is One of Windsor, The Untold Story of America's First Witch Hanging, and that was published in 2015. And that tells the story of Alice Young and the beginnings of New England's colonial witch trials. It even predates Massachusetts, the infamous Salem trials, if you can believe it, uh, almost by 50 years, I think. The Salty Rose, Alchemists, Witches, and a Tapper in New Amsterdam uh, was published in 2019 and won the Literary Prize in Genre Fiction in 2020 from independent publishers of New England. That book explores John Winthrop the Younger's influence on stopping the witch trials in Connecticut, and it gives an insider's view of the takeover of the Dutch colony of New Netherland and the Hartford Witch Panic. Most recently, Beth co-authored the article, Between God and Satan, Thomas Thornton, Witch Hunting and Religious Mission in the English Atlantic World, 1647 to 1693, which appeared in the fall 2022 edition of Connecticut History Review. And she authored that with historian Dr. Uh, Catherine Hermes. Her new novel, a sequel to One of Windsor, is titled Between Good and Evil, Curse of the Windsor Witch's Daughter, and it's coming out this winter. Now, since 2015, Beth has been educating the public about Connecticut witch trials through lectures, articles, and social media. She's been advocating for exoneration through websites and collaborations. And in 2016, she co-founded the Connecticut Witch Memorial with Tony Grigo to raise, to raise awareness about the witch trials before obtaining exoneration for trial victims Alice Young and Lydia Gilbert. And that happened in Windsor in 2017, um, from Windsor in 2017. She's also a co-founder of the Connecticut Witch Trial Exoneration Project that helped to pass Resolution HJ34 in the Connecticut General Assembly in May of 2023 to acknowledge Connecticut's witch trial victims. Tonight's program is called Two of Windsor, Accused and Exonerated of Witchcraft. And I hope you will all enjoy it. And here is Beth. Thank you very much for coming out. The stories I'm going to tell you tonight are extra interesting because they took place just outside this building. So that's really, uh, you know, pretty interesting. Anyway, so tonight we're going to talk about the witches of Windsor, of course, they weren't really witches, and I hope that you will have no doubts about that by the time I get through this presentation. So let me just tell you generally about the Connecticut witch trials. We had 46 accused that we know of, but you know what? Records are being found all the time. Um, 34 were indicted, we had 11 hangings, and we had another person convicted, but they were reprieved. These are the witch hanging victims in Connecticut. Two were from Windsor, and that's what we'll focus on tonight. I do another presentation all over the state, and I really talk in much more general terms, but I want to get down to the nitty gritty, the fine details about Alice Young and Lydia Gilbert. So, you know, what was going on in those days? What led to this witch panic? Well, you know, these were, we're talking about Puritans. They were very fatalistic in their thinking. Um, we're always, we're also talking about, um, fears that stem from Indian wars. The Pequot War happened just a decade before Alice Young was accused and hanged for witchcraft. Um, the Puritan settlers, when they came over and other Europeans, they were operating under the doctrine of discovery, which meant that they were 
they felt free by this document to come and Christianize non-Christian lands. So with the wilderness that was here and the native villages and all that, they saw that as wilderness that was the domain of the devil. And by settling the land, settling the towns, they were claiming land for Christ. Um, so all that led to stress within themselves. Plus they were trying to survive, you know. They had witnessed people coming just years before them who starved to death. They were trying to raise cattle, they were trying to raise livestock and in the, you know, in the wilds of Connecticut in those days, wolves or other wild creatures could get that, get those animals and um, threaten their very survival. They really had to rely on themselves. So what are we talking about when we're talking about witches during that time? The Puritans had a very, very specific definition of what a witch was. And that was someone who was a danger to their society, who had sat down and signed a pact with the devil to do harm to their community, either from jealousy, envy, or perhaps even revenge, or to get something they wanted. Um, you know, I think people forget about that definition or aren't fully aware of what that definition is. There's so many different archetypes of the witch and so many different definitions of the witch. That's not what we think of when we think of modern day Wicca practitioners. That's more nature aligned, empowered, doing good magic for people. Um, it's very, very, very different. It's, it's really, I almost wish there were two different words for it. So, and that is where a lot of confusion starts when we're looking back at history to understand what it actually was. So this is a quote I want to share with you because it's going to come into play when we're talking about Alice Young. This is what Cotton Mather wrote in Wonders of the Invisible World. This was the time of the Salem Witch Panic. I want to show you that there's a continuity from Windsor to that time. In this quote, he says, we have been advised by credible Christians still alive that a malefactor accused of witchcraft as well as murder and executed in this place, meaning the English colonies, more than 40 years ago did then give notice of a horrible plot against the country by witchcraft and a foundation of witchcraft then laid, which if it were not seasonably discovered, would probably blow up and pull down all the churches in the, in the country. Now, relate that to the doctrine of discovery that I was talking about. These Puritans, they were very, very fearful that their experiment to come into native lands, take over, settle them, would be disrupted by the devil. And on the pulpits, they were saying, you know, beware of the devil, beware of the devil, he's gonna try and trip us up. Um, now you notice how he says 40 years ago. Well, this person who I think he was referring to was originally in Windsor for the first witch panic. And we're gonna delve into that a little bit. So, you know, they had all these fears. They thought there, there were witches. They brought these beliefs with them from Europe. Um, so they had to put laws in place so they knew what to do if they found witches. And of course, the punishment for witchcraft back then was death. Now, let me qualify all this. There were people, plenty of people, who practiced folk magic. You know, they would have symbols above their doors for good luck. They would have symbols 
inside their chimneys for good luck, things like that. And those were fairly common. And those didn't necessarily get you in trouble, except for when something really bad was happening and you might have a target on your back for various reasons. So at that time, there was a book. It was called A Discovery of Witches by Matthew Hopkins. He was from Essex, England. He appointed himself as Witchfinder General during the Civil War in England. And this was a book. A lot of these ideas were taken from previous books. But it was basically a guide of how to find a witch. What were the tests that you would use to give evidence that someone was a witch? You could dunk them. And dunking was, this picture is right here. It's showing you, oh, I forgot this. It was showing you that um, they could put someone in the water. If they floated, the purity of the water was supposed to expel the witch. Um, of course, if they sunk, then what happened? So we know that's a <coughs> silly test, obviously. Well, our, all these are. Watching was a form of torture where you just watched someone for hours. You kept them awake to see if they would finally confess or to see if a familiar, an animal who was there to aid in uh, bewitching would come along to suck on a witch's teat. That was the worst part of this torture manual, <clears throat> manual, was finding the witch's teats or the witch's marks. There were women who were wives of the leaders of the town. They would take the accused witches and they would make them strip down. And they would look over their bodies for skin tags, moles, red marks. And if they found those things, they could use that as evidence in a trial to prove that that person was a witch. And we know they used this in Massachusetts for sure, so this could have been used for Alice Young as well. All right, I show you this. Annie Elliot Trumbull, she wrote an article in the Hartford Current in 1904. And this is important because it's the first time the public ever heard about Alice Young. There were just a couple historians who knew about her before that. So there's only a few records, only a few official records about her. And so there's been, haven't, I've had to do a lot of piecing together things. First one was a John Winthrop diary that said one, and there's an actual blank of Windsor arraigned and executed for a witch at Hartford. And nobody knew who that one of Windsor was for ages and ages and ages until they found the Matthew Grant diary in the late 1800s. And there on the inside cover, and this is what you see, May 26th. 47, we know that's 1647, Alice, and they said A-L-S-E, Young, was hanged. Finally, after over 250 years, they figured out who this person was. The only other document, primary document from that time that talks about who she was is in the John Young's disease letter, and we're going to go over that a little bit more, a, a little bit later. Okay, so there's a lot of myths out there, a lot of misinformation. You know, this is, this is mulled around, and people have speculated things for ages and ages. So there's some, uh, there's some common myths that I hope to dispel tonight. They, it, a lot of people think they were latecomers to Windsor. In fact, I even wrote that a little bit in my book. Well, the fact is, they weren't. I'm going to show you why. 
Oxa Young's, Oxa. No, she was never called that ever. <laughs> they were poor. Nope, nope, they weren't. And a whole bunch of things about the daughter. So let's get into that. They were latecomers to Windsor. No, they really weren't. Um, I've poured over the land records in Windsor, and the land records don't really start until the very, very late uh, 1639 or so, the end of the year. So this is a very early record from February 4th, 1640. So remember, the land records hadn't been around for a long time at all. Right here, we're talking about uh, an exchange that somebody made with John Young and Rhoda Taylor, his next door neighbor for farmland. So five and a half acres. So, and this isn't the only one like this. There's a lot of land records where they mention John Young, like, oh, he's to the south, he's to the west, he bought a small, small parcel. These guys, these early people, they bought, uh, you know, tons of property and they'd exchange it all the time. They'd have their home lot, but then they'd have their wood lot, they'd have farm lots. Okay, and then this starts. Henry Stiles is a wonderful historian from the 1800s, but this Oxa Young's thing started with him because there's no original record that talks about it. He was talking about the Matthew Grant diary just being found, and he was trying to remember. Okay, I've heard, I've heard, but he's not actually looking at the document in front of him. So he's guessing what he remembered, and it, he remembered Oxa Young's, but that's not right. Um, okay, there's a myth that they were poor since they lived on Backer Row. Backer Row was an area of Windsor where eventually a lot of poor people did move there. But I think it did not become poor until after this Alice Young case. Um, first of all, the people they were living around, the Tinkers, they were from a wealthy textile family. And then John Young, first of all, you know, I, I don't know why this took me so long to see. It's right next to the page where he bought the property on Backer Row, right next to it. But... Uh, Right about the same time, 1641, he buys from the plantation 40 acres of land. That's a pretty big tract of land. So that's just south on the other side of the river from um, where their home lot is. So that would have probably been a big agricultural piece of land. The second thing was when he dies, um, all there is is an inventory, but in that inventory are books. There's a few books, so what does that mean? The guy can read, or his wife Alice could read. Um, and then, of course, the, the value of his holdings, it wasn't, you know, it didn't show him to be poor. He was a uh, very solid middling, middling class. Okay, and then the myths that have to do about Alice Young Beeman, the daughter. Um, I've heard over and over again that she got married in Springfield. No, she didn't. She actually stayed around Windsor. Who she was with, I don't really know. But she married in Windsor on December 15th, 1654. Now, people get confused and think it's October. And the reason why, I don't know if you can see that very well, this is 10th month of the, of the year, 1654. It says 10th month because they were in the Julian calendar. So if they said 10th month, it meant December. You know, the last two months of that calendar were January and February, and it started again in March. That's why if you see colonial dates, 1642 slash 43, the 42 is the Julian year. The 43 is the Gregorian, Gregorian calendar year. So it can be confusing. But she married in Windsor, and um, it was just about two and a half weeks after Lydia Gilbert was convicted. 
she had a lot of children, about 13. Um, and a lot of people think that she was accused and maybe indicted up in Springfield where she moved with her husband, but she really wasn't. It was more of a slander case. In, in any case, what it does show is that if your family member had been accused of witchcraft and even hanged for it, there was, there was, family, there was like a family stain, and it stayed with you for decades and decades. Um, the other thing was, when John Young died, you know, people assume definitely the daughter. Well, she took the name Young, so definitely a daughter in some way. But when he, when he you know, died, he, there was only an inventory. There was no will. And he was sick for seven months. If people are sick for that long, they usually think about you know, writing a will for their <clears throat> child. So his property sat for seven years, bought in 1668, and um, not, not claimed by Alice Jr. And she had four sons at the time. So let's see, a couple other background things before we get into the case. So back a row was where Alice Young lived. Do you guys know where that is now? Well, anyone who's been on my witch walks knows. It's um, off Pearson Lane. It's that driveway where the bottle recycling place is. There's a, um, if you superimpose an old map on a new one, if you go down that driveway and you hit the fence that has recently been built, that property behind the fence would have been the John Young property in Windsor. And it used to be a through street but a um, housing development was built in the, six, in the 1950s, and so that's why it's just a driveway now. And of course, you know, it looks nothing like it would have looked back then. So the people that Alice and John Young were surrounded by were um, members of the Tinker family. They had different last names, they were all women, so there were Sensions, Thorntons, Taylors, but they're all part of the same family, right? And um, they, were, they were pretty, at least middle class, because their father had been a textile merchant. So there was a lot that was happening on Backer Row. And this is the area of England, kind of near London. Um, and I'll show you the big map because, okay, so they're here. They're from like the middle of England, but most of the Windsor settlers are from the southwest of England. So in those days, regionalism would have been much more pronounced than it is now. Different ways of thinking, different ways of being educated, different ways of talking. So that may have played a part in her accusation. Um, and, and, you know, there's other things that suggest she was either very close to that family or that she was um, even a family member or her husband could have been a family member. Uh, land was sold from the one family member to John Young, and then it's sold again to another family member. Rody Tinker remarries, so it all stays within the family. And then after Alice Young's death in 1647, this family, they just spread out. They're very fractured, but they, most of them get out of town, except for uh, one woman. Her name is Rhody. She's the next door neighbor, and she's waiting. She has to wait seven years to marry because her husband has died in a shipwreck. So, but she leaves right around the same time that Alice Jr. does. So a lot of people wonder who Alice Young is and who she was. Unfortunately, I'm going to tell you right now, all this is speculative. We don't have hard records. I really wish we did because it drives me crazy, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think she was Alice, Young, Alice Ashby of Cambridge and that she married 
once she got here to John Yim. Um, and I think this because I literally took every Alice that I found in colonial records at that time and was able to trace them to where they were, what families they were connected to. And with Alice, I found that there was a connection to the Tinker family. Um, this person was a maidservant. She was 20 years old when she came on the ship defense in 1635. And it was interesting, she would have been, her mistress would have been Winifred Holman, who she worked for, who in the actual historical record is identified as a healer, who is identified as being accused of witchcraft at some point. So anyway, this was my theory. And so I went to Cambridge, um, told you about that part. Um, well, what I found in Cambridge was disappointing and exciting at the same time. The original records uh, for, you know, vital statistics, birth, death, marriage, they're gone. Nobody knows what happened to them. Property records gone, all these original records just gone. But who knows when they were gone. There were people in the 1800s who were writing about the original records. So some, there is in this book about New England marriages something about youngs, a young person getting married with somebody else in 1638 in Cambridge, which would be right on target, but again, it's not <clears throat> enough information to know. I also found another marriage record in there. It says 16 blank, Cambridge, Alice blank, John blank. Oh, no. uh. <laughs> Make me crazy. Um, but what I did find that I thought was really interesting was a Holman property. They had lot 18, and right next to them were Young's right next door. Um, so. It doesn't prove my theory, but maybe, maybe if we can find original records, maybe I'm on the right path. So what actually happened in Windsor? Why, why was Alice the first witch hanging victim? Well, there was a very deadly epidemic that year. Um, and sources say it was probably a flu epidemic. The death toll went, you know, it was over four times the amount, almost five times the amount from the previous year. And there were a lot of children who died. Um, my background is nursing so and public health. So I was thinking, hmm, where were these people that died? Well, wouldn't you know, four of them are right next door to Alice Young. So proximity, right? Then there's other prominent people who lose children as well. Like the town minister, he lost two people. And the town doctor lost a person. There were legislators as well. So um, it was interesting. Alice Young's neighbor again, like part of this big extended family, Thomas Thornton, he was so affected by the tragedy of losing his four children. <clears throat> he went from being a tanner to being a minister. And there's an article in the back, and if you guys are interested in it, um, Kathy Hermes and I wrote a, an academic article about how after this happens in Windsor, how he seems to be a bystander at all these witch trial events, including the ones in Salem. That's why when I read that original quote, I do think Cotton Mather was talking about Thomas Thornton. Thomas Thornton eventually goes to Ireland and he does meet the Mathers. He moves after Windsor, he moves to Stratford right away. John Young moves to Stratford as well. And there, Goody Bassett, she dies for witchcraft. 
Then he meets the Mathers in Ireland and ends up back in New England. And as he retires, the Salem Witch Trials are going on and he becomes a member of Cotton Mather's church. We even have a letter of his where he was writing to increase Mather, Cotton Mather's father. So interesting enough, Cotton Mather, knowing this guy, and Increase Mather knowing this guy, um, they're well acquainted. They would have known what happened right here in Windsor um, because they're fellow ministers. And so in 1700, there's something that comes out about Priscilla Thornton. She would have been the next door neighbor of Alice Young. And Alice Jr. would have been her playmate. So what did Priscilla Thornton have to say as she was dying about what was going on in the neighborhood? I thought this was fascinating. And this is probably the most we're going to get about the actual events of what happened. Um, and these are just different pieces of this, um, of this document that was written about her said she was one remarkably grave, devout, and serious. She was nonetheless troubled with sore temptations and exercises about the state of her own soul. The anguish of her spirit about her body of death caused her to pour out many tears and prayers, and she pressed that some of the other pious children of her acquaintance might keep a day of humiliation together. That, as she expressed it, they might get power over their sinful natures. It grieved her that she had sinned against him who had done and died for her. And later on, twas because they had curbed her and restrained her from sinful vanities. And she said, were I now to choose my company, it should be among the people of God. I have been much troubled by Satan, but I find Christ is too hard for him and sin and all. Now keep in mind, when this was published, people were done with the witch trials. They had, it, it had gone crazy in Salem. There were over 200 people accused. So when you start to see the writings about 1700, they don't want to talk about witch trials. They realize, oh, we really blew it with this. We went a little nuts. But, you know, reading through this, like, what was going on, Priscilla? Man, I wish I could talk to her. So, yes, what was happening on Backer Row? When we looked at Backer Row and the inhabitants of Backer Row, we also noticed there were a lot of tween girls, a lot of teenage girls as well. Um, so, and I do wonder if Priscilla herself was Alice Young's accuser with everything she said previously. And, you know, she did die during that time. Also, did this first conviction start a pattern, you know, that we see in other witch trials as far as fits, as far as delirium and saying crazy things? Um, so, could the fits, since it was an epidemic and, and there was flu going around, could the fits have been related to febrile seizures? I mean, that happens. What about seeing specters or saying someone came and pinched me in the night? Could that have been from confusion or delirium? It's a possibility. You know, it's funny, on the last witch walk I did last Sunday, a woman, I was talking about this, and a woman said, I, I need to tell you this story. When I was a kid, I, ha I was really sick, and I came to my parents and I said, my brother put glass in my bed and he's trying to hurt me. That was real. And I was like, that, that's incredible. Are you telling me this story? This is case in point, you know? that here's this little girl, she was sick, this is in our era, but we understand that she 
was confused and she was saying these crazy things about her brother trying to hurt her because she was very sick. But could something like that have started all these witch trials? Because you see this pattern over and over again. It starts the Hartford witch panic, you know, little Betty Kelly. The neighbor brings her soup and then she gets sicker. And then, you know, she's saying, oh, so-and-so, I saw her spirit, I saw her specter in my sleep, and she was pinching me, and all this. Um, you know, we can again, I wish we knew more, but unfortunately, don't have a ton of records from these witch trials. So it's just a matter of piecing stuff together. So what were, what were strikes or possible strikes against Alice Young? Well, we already know she's probably not part of the majority group. And the minority group she's with, um, the, brother, the brother of that group, John Tinker, he's like the right hand man of the Winthrops. Well, coming to Windsor, guess who doesn't like the Winthrops? The leader here, Roger Ludlow, does not like the Winthrops at all. So, um, and, and Windsor, you know, it didn't start out as being named Windsor where these family, where this Tinker family is from. It started out being called Dorchester, where the majority people are from. So who knows if there was any tension from that. So she may have been a healer from the reasons I explained. Now, um, before Salem, Richard Ross and his book, he also assumes she's a healer. That's also, you know, speculative. But he assumes it for different reasons. He thinks because um, John Young, and we'll talk about this, he had disease that was, there was a description of that disease that she had to learn to be a healer to address his chronic disease. So either way, that m might have been a mark against her in this specific situation. She only had one child. They, you know, the leaders, the religious leaders, wanted women to, for biblical reasons, produce a lot of kids, but also for political reasons. They're trying to increase their population. They want to take over native populations. They want to take over Dutch populations. So it's kind of like, hey, come on, spit a, a couple more kids out for the team, right? And if you didn't fit that stereotype, or you didn't fit that gender role, then uh, you know, he'd be looked down upon. And also, when somebody had few children, the, you know, the, the church imposed on the others this belief that, oh, they must be jealous because they can only have, they only have one kid. They're jealous of people who have more children. And it was commonly thought of that those women would be jealous and they would be more likely to turn to a witchery um, because they were jealous of the women with many children. Of course, you know, that, that was what the church leaders are saying to put in women's minds, but who knows if they actually believe that, right? Um, so probably her biggest strike besides that is she's right next door to a household where they've lost four children and her one child survived. Other things that I don't know if this was part of her case or not, but these were common reasons why you could have a target on your back. Um, again, you didn't fit into an accepted gender role. You were, you know, you would be quick to defend yourself or, you know, you weren't necessarily submissive. That could get you in trouble. Um, and then contacts with natives. Remember me saying, you know, the settlers, they often did not understand natives. And they viewed them as part of the devil's land. They totally, um, they were misinformed about who they were. And so we see it in a lot of witch trial cases that if there was an exchange with natives, um, if there were relationship with natives, that that could put a mark on your back too for suspicion of witchcraft. There's actually a lot of cases, including in the Hartford Witch Panic. Um, all the people partying on the South Green, they think they're partying with the natives 
who are just living right next door in the South Meadow in their wigwams, and they come up and they're celebrating Christmas together, just, you know, to party, because Puritans did not celebrate things like that. So um, people were looked at for suspic with suspicion for having those relationships, even just with exchanges. So what's the aftermath of her death? John Young and the Thorntons, they moved to Stratford. Tinker family, they're very fragmented. Alice Jr. is in Windsor. I said she married. Rhoda Taylor mentioned her. She married to a neighbor. Uh, but they both leave around the same time. And the community changes. Um, people are more fearful. And a lot of other people that come from Windsor to other places, they get accused of witchcraft, like Goody Bassett in Stratford. Um, Marshfield, who was from Windsor, she goes up to Springfield. Somebody accuses her of witchcraft. Um, so it just, it just seems to follow people wherever they go. This is a description of John Young's disease. I know, I don't expect you to read it. <laughs> <coughs> And that's the back, and um, this actually says, John Young of about Stratford, his wife was hanged for a witch at Hartford. So that's the other piece of information that we have that indeed she was married to John Young. Um, so nobody knew who wrote that, that um, letter about John Young's uh, disease, and basically someone was writing to Winthrop Jr. and saying, um, this guy, he has a disease, there's peeling skin, there's all this kind of stuff, um, you know, what is it? So we were studying this guy Thornton, and we had the letter that he wrote to Increase Mather, and Kathy Herman said, you know, this handwriting looks really familiar. So we looked at the description of John Young's disease with this other document and found that it was a pretty close match. We brought it to a handwriting specialist and they said, well, the older one is a little bit improved, but that's exactly what we'd expect, expect because this guy was a tanner and then he became a minister and all of a sudden he's writing and you know he would have to improve his writing a tiny bit. Um, as far as what John Young's disease was, Dr. Harris, who um, used to be a volunteer here, quite beloved, he um, did an inquiry with a medical historian, and he said some of the description of the peeling skin could match somebody with scarlet fever. So, but who knows? It's really hard to go back and figure it out. And this is his death record. I told you about the will not having one and nobody as his heir. Um, and as far as the community changing, this happened right around the time of Alice Young's hanging. They really tightened the laws around here. No smoking tobacco in public. And remember, they're growing tobacco around here. <laughs> so, uh, and limited time in taverns, you know? You're thirsty? Okay, go ahead, wet your whistle, but don't stay too long. Don't get drunk. Um, and then they designed laws to have further separation from natives. And in their writing it says because they did not want the natives to corrupt the Purit Puritan youth. So anyway, I, have, I, I know I have a lot more about Alice, um, but I do want to talk about Lydia too. Poor Lydia, her case is so bonkers. Lydia was our second witch trial victim in Windsor, seven years after Alice Young. And by the way, this period, 1647 to 1654, that was the most deadly in Connecticut. So this, I get this all the time. Who was she? Was she the wife of Thomas Sr.? or Thomas Jr.? You know, some people are like, my grandmother Lydia, and I'm like, I don't, I don't think she had children. Um, 
Thomas Sr. was living in Braintree until 1646, and then he moved to Glastonbury. Um, the property record we have for the Gilberts in Windsor, they came in 1644. Um, Thomas Jr. was in Connecticut a lot earlier, and uh, Jonathan Gilbert, by the way, is um, his brother, who was a marshal in Hartford, who brought all the witch trial victims to the um, gallows. So um, the reason more recently historians think that it's Thomas Jr. Um, who Lydia was married to is because of this passage in the colonial records. Will Roscoe is to take into custody James Hullett, Thomas Gibbert, or Gilbert, Lydia Bliss, and George Gibbs, and to keep them in guise and give, which is, you know, keep them in shackles and give them coarse diet, hard work, and sharp correction. Well, this guy, Will Rescue or Roscoe, he was the jailer in Hartford. So if they're saying arrest them to this guy, it means take them to prison. All right, so they had a crime. We don't know what, it's not specified, but it was bad enough where they had to go to prison for a while. So, and remember that because that definitely is a factor that can cause you to be looked at as a witch. Um, the jurymen from Windsor, there's a few of them on this list from that court. And, you know, small towns, really more like villages. People talk, they've been on the jury, of course. People that, you know, everyone's gonna know about the Gilberts. So where did they live? Well, I'll show you the property record, but they were way up Palisado, way up north. You know where Hayden Station is? This is Hayden's property. Here's Gilberts. Um, and so they were at the far edges of the north. And again, they were kind of in with this group that um, weren't the mainstream group of town. And, and this, this is accurate because it's proven in this property record. So the Gilberts moved here, Jan, or, or bought the land January 24, 1644. Um, so if it's the same people, which I think it is, their jail stint would have been more recent. Um, and historian Richard Ross agrees with all this too. So what happened to Lydia? This is the craziest story. 58-year-old Henry Stiles, he's killed by an accidental discharge of a gun. The militia, they're practicing on the town green and a gun goes off. Well, it turns out Henry is a boarder with the Gilberts and he owes them large debts. It's just the next month, this happens in October, in November, they quickly go through his inventory and they discover he owes a lot of debt to the Gilberts. He hasn't paid them in like over a year, a year and a half. I think they said 1649. Excuse me. Yes. When you say uh, the militia was practicing on the green, do you mean the green right here? Yeah, I mean right here. Okay. Right here. <laughs> Talk about, you know, history right next to you, right? Um, so anyway, the person handling the musket, it, his name is Thomas Allen. He's 19 years old. Um, I don't know if he's not paying attention or what, but the gun misfires. It kills Henry Stiles. Um, it was by his hand. And they say it's sinful neglect. He gets charged 20 pounds. He has to um, promise not to carry a gun. And one would think that's done, right? It should have been done. But no, they just, they just couldn't accept it. Or the Allens, they were a very wealthy, prominent family in town. They probably couldn't live with that verdict. So, three whole years after the tragedy of Henry Stiles' death, <clears throat> Lydia gets accused of bewitching the gun that killed him. Very unfair, you know? It's 
talk about rumor mill, going around for three years, getting to that point. And, you know, poor Lydia. The strikes against her would have been no kids, a previous crime. She was a woman, that whole gender thing. Was she, did she speak her mind, you know? Um, again, we don't know. Did she have exchange with natives being on the far edge of Windsor? Did you know, she trade agricultural products or whatever? Even that could have gotten her in trouble. She was more of a newcomer. Um, and if she, you know, with Lydia Bliss, there was one Bliss family that we know of, and a woman in that family had been accused of witchcraft up in Springfield. So again, attachment to another relative who was accused of witchcraft, that could have also been a strike against her. This is her indictment. It usually says something about entertaining Satan, and then you deserve to die, because that's the prescri prescribed remedy by the law. So what's the aftermath? Well, for Lydia, it's not good. We don't have the, we have the conviction record, but we don't have the hanging record, but most historians agree that, you know, it would have been really hard for her to escape. So she most likely was hanged to death, but then um, Thomas Allen, his reputation is cleared. He gets his fines back, um, and a few years later, he gets to marry the minister's daughter. And then her husband goes up to Springfield, and marry somebody else, you know, kind of within that family. So, not so good for Lydia. Now, again, this is a period where it's the most brutal time of witch hunting. Too bad these accusations couldn't have happened a little later. John Winthrop Jr., he's an alchemist who's a doctor for all over the colony of Connecticut, and he's an alchemist, so he doesn't and, you know, that's the beginning of chemistry. It's a little bit magical yet. They don't have all the science yet behind it. And so he's an expert on both magic and being a physician on thing, all things medical. And when he witnesses during cases for witch trials, he always says, you know, that they weren't caused by witchcraft. They were caused by something medical or something else that was more reasonable. So he ends up saving a lot of lives um, until the Hartford Witch Panic when he has to go get the charter. And then, you know, all hell breaks loose. But he is a force in Connecticut that has a very calming effect on witch accusations. It just so happens John Tinker, one of that Tinker family, works for him. And this was really cool. Um, it probably doesn't have anything to do with this, but I just thought it was very, very cool. Um, when Winthrop Jr. was away getting the charter, uh, he was representing him in New London. This was a treaty. Um, this is Casa Cinnamon. He was the, the Sagawam, or chief of the remaining Pequot tribe. And these are other marks of tribal people. One is from the Mohican tribe, and I'm not sure what this is. I'm still just trying to um, piece all this together and figure this out, but this is, this is really cool. And this is his signature right here. So. Where is John Winthrop from? Um, John Winthrop Jr., he started out in, as a colonist, he started out in uh, Massachusetts Bay where his father was the leader. And then he came down to Connecticut and his interests started out from his alchemical needs um, for metals and things. Um, but he was also a f alchemical physician and he went around and he gave his services for free. So people in Connecticut loved him for that. Um, and they, also with his interest in alchemy, you know, there were other uses, other inventions. And so they nominated him to be governor. He wasn't even running 
um, he stepped down for a year and they wanted him back. And basically they would not let him step down until he finally died in 1676. So he's a very interesting Renaissance type man person who really changed the tra trajectory of the witch trials in Connecticut to be so different than the ones in Massachusetts. So um, just before we get to the end here, I just want you to be aware of, you know, why we might think these trials are so unjust. People really didn't have any rights um, to, against self-incrimination. They were encouraged to talk. They were tortured for hours on end to stay awake, to speak. Um, they didn't have lawyers to represent them. And think about the evidence again that was held against them. It was finding a witch's teeth or mark, which I'm sorry, but we'd all be witches. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, of course, the other thing was one person could just say, oh, I saw, I, I saw, I saw Sue Spectre in the middle of the night. And she came and she was pinching me, and that's why I'm sick now. Right, you know? With Winthrop too, he stopped all that. Finally, when he came back with the charter and he saw what was happening in, during the Hartford Witch Panic, um, he required uh, that there be a two-person rule so that one person couldn't just say, that person's specter visited me you know, and hurt me. There had to be a witness for every single accusation, every single incident. And that also, you know, put things more at a lull in Connecticut. So, anyway, I know these were great injustices. And as far as uh, how they spent their final days, where Old State House is now was where the meeting house in Hartford was. And then south of that was a tavern. So probably either place was where the trials took place. They didn't really have a courthouse per se in those days. And then on the north end of that green was the prison um, where William Roscoe was taking them and you know putting them in chains. So where were the hanging sites? Some people speculate, well, maybe right there since the jail was right near there. But if we judge by... Um, Salem, how they were usually spectacles and they were a mile away, like on a hill. That could have happened in Hartford too. There is a historian, William de Los Love, who found a property record that referred to the hanging site about a mile up Albany Avenue. Um, and he pointed out, you know, where this was in around 1910 or so with his book. Um, you know, for years, friends and I were like, okay, where is that site? Where is it? Because all those properties are broken up now. They're so different. Couldn't figure it out. Couldn't figure it out. Um, the Goodwood lot, where was that? Um, until a friend of mine says, Beth, hey, look in the Hartford Current in the 1930s. Like, oh, of course. When this guy wrote this book and found that property, that referred to the hanging site. And, and this is not just for witches. This is for other people who were hanged. And um, there were photographs, photographs. So this was, this was the old Goodwin Inn on Albany Avenue. This is going north towards Simsbury. And this tree on a rise, it was called the Witch Elm. We don't know if it was the tree, but it was in this area when the Goodwin lot was much bigger. Right now that's Irving Street and Albany Avenue. And this is looking south, going downtown that way. Right now the Community Health Center is there. And uh, you know what's there now? I, I mean, really, you, you never would realize it. That Goodwin Inn was torn down in the 1950s to, for progress. A parking lot, oh. Ugh. right? And then the elm, a lot of the elms died of Dutch elm disease, but this one was actually cut down and this leveled out 
for business. Well, guess what business is there right now? A spirit shop. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So anyway, um, I want to just talk to you briefly about what we did in the legislature. I think you understand now at this point why these, why these cases were so unjust. Um, we, a lot of people didn't even know about the witch trials in Connecticut, so we, wanted, we started a project, the Connecticut Witch Trial Exoneration Project, um, and Jane Garibay, who was our rep in Windsor, she agreed to help us out, um, and then Senator Saud Anwar, he joined in later on. So, and this is, I've been talking about historian Kathy Hermes, she's right there. Um, you may have heard about it in the news. We had young William who, uh, speak, and he was incredible. Then we had um, Catherine Carmen. She was amazing, too. Um, anyway, it was, it, was, it was really wonderful. It ended up being co-sponsored by 24 people, and it ended up being bipartisan. The lieutenant governor was supportive. Um, I love this picture. They asked uh, Representative Garibay to join Senator Anwar down in the Senate as our resolution was passing. And it passed on May the 25th, the eve of the anniversary of Alice Young's hanging. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a really special moment. Who was Young William, did you say? Oh, William Schlope. He was covered by the press a lot. He spoke about um, the children of those who were hanged being victims because they lost their parents. Are there living uh, descendants? Oh yeah, there are, there are many, 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 th there are thousands. Um, and as far as, you know, the stain of witchcraft, it did go from generation to generation. It's not, not so much now, you know, people are doing ancestry and joking around, oh yeah, I have a witch in my family, yeah, that's why, you know, I'm so outspoken or whatever. But there are, I've talked to so many descendants who are telling me, well, you know, that's fairly a new thing because their great-grandmothers and their grandmothers, they didn't want to talk about this. It was still a source of shame for them. Um, so what this does, it acknowledges all the research by historians over the last 50 years or so that show that these people were innocent. They were not guilty of doing harm to their communities. Um, it names all the victims, because how can you clear somebody's name if they're not named, right? Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I did not like, I'll be honest, um, it changed the word exonerate, which means some, and this, this happened in the House of Representatives, in the, yeah, the reps did this, um, the opposing party. They did not like the word exonerate, but I think they really just still don't understand the witch trial history and what all it means, because exonerate means you're innocent. Right? You were wrongfully convicted. I don't like the word absolve because it means you have sinned and you have been forgiven. And that is not really in line with what we want, right? But the bill was probably going, the resolution was probably going to be blocked if we did not make a compromise on this. So as mad as I was, um, I deferred to some descendants and they said, look, it's really hard to get this stuff through. In Salem, things changed over time. You know, people amended what was there. And so if, if more people are discovered in historical records, um, and descendants want to go for it and say, look, I don't like that word. It's more of a religious word. There's separation of church and state. Um, they can go back and they can try and amend it because that is much, much easier than starting from scratch. So basically, that's what we did. 
Um, this also allows us wider support um, for, you know, to get permanent history exhibits about this information in Connecticut, because there is really no one permanent history exhibit about it. We also want to do a Connecticut Witch Trial Trail, where we hope different historical societies, <clears throat> looking at you, Windsor, and, you know, Stratford, and all these other places where these things happened, have something, and there can be a centralized website. Um, there was an apology to the families of the victims, and a lot of people were like, well, how can you, how can you apologize for something that happened, you know, way before? Well, a lot of this is in the sense of empathy. All right. Uh, oh, Joe, I'm sorry your wife died. I'm sorry she suffered. Did I cause the suffering? No. But I'm showing empathy when I say that. So a lot of it was done in that was the meaning of this. But yet there were some descendants of perpetrators who wanted to do it as a way to say, hey, our families feel bad about this. We, we truly do feel sorry to your families. But that was on a much more personal level. So I have copies of the bill, the, orig uh, the resolution original and the changed one over there on the table. You could also look online and see it in all the stages. So it would be nice to memorialize the victims somehow because descendants have nowhere to go. There would be no graves anywhere. Um, they're probably thrown in ditches or their families just snuck off with them when no one was looking. So one thing that, you know, really struck me about passing this resolution now was hearing from advocates elsewhere in the world where witch hunting is still actually happening. This is a United Nations Human Rights Council major concern. Over 20,000 people between 2009 and 2019 were hunted as witches mostly women in over 60 countries, including the United States. There are stories of you know, a preacher in Tennessee uh, pointing someone out in his congregation as a witch and the trailer of that person being burned down. So, you know, I mean, this superstition, it's still alive. And these advocates who are risking their lives to help some of these victims in modern days, we're really grateful um, that this resolution did pass in Connecticut. So it does have present day meaning for people as well. So anyway, um, I thank you for coming. If you would like to learn more about Connecticut Witch Trials, visit the Facebook page, CT Witch Memorial, or Connecticut Witch Trial Exoneration Project. We have lots of info. Um, if you want to learn more about my own uh, personal projects, One of Windsor is a story about Alice Young. It's sold here. Um, the Salty Rose, that's largely about John Tinker and John Winthrop Jr. and all his uh, alchemy and all that. That's also here. Um, if you want to find out about that academic article, it's on the table there, but I have a link on my website to how to get to it. Um, and coming soon, and I bet I, I want to see if you know who the artist was who did this cover or who the model was. It's Sue. It's Sue, yes, Sue. Our own Sue. And who was the model? Can anyone guess? Does anybody know Kristen? Well, anyway, that's Kristen. She modeled for her. So anyway, I hope to have that out this winter. And that is about Alice Jr. So, and then this is the academic article. And of course, um, last but definitely not least, this is 
where to go. This is one place out of many you can go to learn about witch hunts that are still happening. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, no, they were probably in that area in Hartford. Um, they could have been thrown in a ditch and the animals got them or, um, you know, their family snuck in the middle of the night when the authorities weren't looking and took the bodies away and then gave them a proper burial. But they, it would have been on the hush-hush. You don't think it was Windsor there? Maybe, I don't know, I don't know. Like um, the Salem witch trial victims, I know there were a couple where the families did get the bodies and they brought them back, like Rebecca Nurse Homestead, they brought her back. Um, so it's possible, but I don't really know. I mean, I wish I knew more. How did you happen to get into this How did I get into this? Um, well, I moved from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I was, very excited to go to Salem one weekend, and my neighbor said, well, you know, the very first person to hang for witchcraft was in Windsor, and I, I was honestly shocked. Um, I, I just thought, why don't most people know about this? I mean, knowing what I knew about the witch trials, I, I you know, I just knew they were unjust, and... Um, I just thought, what a shame. Here, this person, she lost her life, um, and nobody knows about her. Um, let's talk about her. Let's be honest about this history. So, and then, you know, I, and then I just kind of went crazy with it. <laughs> Was there reasons given why they didn't like the word exoneration? Do you think it had to do with maybe them being held liable for... No, well, they were saying for legal reasons, we're not a colony, but the thing is, as a state, we use the charter from the colony all the way until 1818. So, and then, you know, they thought, well, well, we can't do it for legal reasons, but there's also, if you see in the original document, it says they could have just taken out the word exoneration and then just said, Connecticut sees these victims as, as innocent. They took out that too. But keep in mind, the guy who insisted on doing this was the one you heard about in the newspapers who was saying uh, to the very first person to testify at judiciary, she was testifying about her grandmother, Goody Knapp. He said to her, how do you know your grandmother wasn't really a witch? Oh. It was the same person. You know, so I, I think it, it was just a lot of ignorance about what the history really was. And, and not wanting to learn about it either. Because, you know, that same person and somebody else, they left the room before Kathy Hermes, our colonial legal scholar, spoke at that judiciary committee. But yet when Catherine Carmen, our 14-year-old girl, was talking about it, they just shot questions at her. And it, you know, wow. yeah, no, there, there, was, there was some resistance. And then they finally came around, but it was only if we changed the language. And I still think they don't understand the difference between, you know, what a witch might be viewed as now compared to the whole different definition back then of someone who was truly doing harm to their community. It's unfortunate. It sounds like there's still an undertone of bias and the situation today of forcing the bill to be reported, points towards mm -hmm. residual hate, bias, discrimination. So in today's definition is which that they tie back to them and that's something yeah. That hatred, virtue, that everyone calls, that is still there. Yeah, no, and I mean. I speak from the perspective of one that fled the state, not literally a witch hunt, but fleeing persecution for who I am. Yeah. Coming to Connecticut is a safe place from another state where there's still 
where that mentality is in the strong majority and it's very real, very dangerous. Yeah. Really. So. Yeah, and these these are these are lessons that, that can so teach us. Connecticut learned it earlier and worked through it earlier and now is, yes. is in the leadership mm -hmm. is, but is there's revenues that other states in the union right now today are carrying out massive rich pits yeah. in the broader sense on on people that just are living their world. Yeah, living their lives and are different. And um, unfortunately, though, you know, people who don't want to really understand what the history is, who'd rather shut down than just look at what the facts are, um, they're in Connecticut, too. You can't ever. Yeah. 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 No, it's. It, and it's a reason why we gotta we gotta keep talking about this stuff, um, you know. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Yes. I heard you and Catherine Harmon speak at the local NPR radio being interviewed. Did an excellent job. Oh, thank you. It was very engaging. I have to tell you, um, I didn't know I was going to be on, and Catherine didn't know either, because um, I had been interviewed on NPR not this year, but um, last year when we were just beginning this, and they had interviewed me. Mm -hmm. um, so they had. That was just a recording of me from last year, and Catherine Carmen. That was her testimony. Uh -huh. um, yeah, my husband listens to her and says, that's not a 14-year-old girl. <laughs> you know, those, those guys, they were just throwing questions at her, and she just, she just stood proud, and she just, she was so good. She's so poised. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, you could tell that on NPR. Um, but yeah, so, and then I'm texting her mom, hey, Catherine's on, <laughs> Catherine's on NPR. <laughs> Who is Catherine, Catherine Carmen? Um, Catherine Carmen, you got, you probably know the name Carmen because Carmen Funeral Homes. Um, John Carmen's granddaughter, and she's she's very poised and she's very well spoken. Um, we were wondering if there were any kids that might be interested in testifying, and she was one recommended to us um, because she had. One or come in second for a speech um, contest, and you know this aligned with so many of her interests that she she was right on board, and she learned so fast, and she was so eloquent. But yeah, so that was cool too to have three three Windsor women, Catherine Carmen, myself, and then Jane Garibay advocating for two Windsor women from the past, Alice Young and Lydia Gilbert. That, that was, uh, that will always mean a lot to me.